This is the Get A Life Podcast, X-Cult Conversations. Today we are full of female power. Um, today with me I've got Carmen and our special guest, Anne Hamilton. Um, we are going to dive into Anne's story and let her tell us uh, where she's from and kind of how where she got to where she's at, what made her be kicked out and um, dive into all of that. Anne, do you want to take it away and let the listeners yeah. know where you're from? Okay, so yeah, originally I was born in Northern Ireland and yeah, at the age of 18, I married a brother and guy um, and because I he was from Coventry, I had to move there, obviously. Um, just, yeah, rewind a little bit back to my childhood and that. Um, I'm one of six children and yeah, our family was always looked on as probably a little bit like yours, Carmen, a bit special. <laughs> uh, so, so my my grandfather, first cousin to JT Junior. So my great grandmother, yeah, my great grandmother, sister to JT Senior. Mm. So we were always sort of, I, don't, I would say a bit of pride in our family. Um, and my grandpa was, took the lead in Belfast uh, when I was growing up until he died. At, well, actually, no, that's wrong. He actually was shut up. Um, yeah, uh, he was... <laughs> So the reason he was shut up was my auntie, his his daughter, my grandpa just had two children, my dad and dad sister, Auntie Mary. And my Auntie Mary, um, she had got into a bit of an argument with her mother-in-law and pulled her mother-in-law's hair. <laughs> <laughs> and for that reason, for that reason, she was shut up, her and her whole family, six, six or seven children. I can't remember how many there were, but they were shut up. My grandpa, he wasn't involved in the shutting up of them. And he was upset. He got, he actually cried in the meeting. And for that reason, he was shut up. Wow. Wow. And it probably, I don't, because I was only like seven, eight at the time. I don't remember the actual timings, but it was certainly very close. He was shut up for six weeks. And then Simington said it was wrong. He should, he shouldn't have been shut up. So he was brought back and it probably, in my mind, it was only maybe three or six months later that he died suddenly. Um, he was 74, so he was fairly young really. But yeah, very sudden death. And according to Simington, um, the Lord took him because the brethren didn't want him. So there was always a bit of a, you know, Grandpa was a bit of a hero really in the brethren's eyes. Personally, I, I as a child, I was actually quite scared of him. I don't know why. I was a bit scared of men in general, and I was certainly scared of him. Um, anyway, after Grandpa's death, my dad became the leader. Which, uh, yeah, it's not exactly easy being a child of a leader in the brother. <laughs> you sort of, yeah, you're you sort of looked down on a bit and whispered about and yeah but I was always a bit of a rebel I was a bit of black sheep of the family I suppose and um at the age of 13 I would say I consciously questioned I didn't just question the brother and I just questioned everything I questioned the bible really and I started to make sort of bargains with God that you know well if this happens I'll believe you're right you know and I, <laughs> I don't know if you've ever done that, but yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and obviously I, I went to mainstream school as we did in those days. Didn't really have many friends with the, yeah, going home for lunch thing and all that. Um, at the age of 16, me and my best friend, Scylla, and my second cousin, Kenny, who we were all very close and we consciously tried to leave. 
but just couldn't do it. For a start, with next to no education, with no money, we knew we'd lose everything. Um, yeah, we got well. Actually, I couldn't couldn't bear to break my parents' heart either. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So from then on, it was I suppose I just thought, right, I've got to get married. Um, and the first three day meetings I went to, um, I met my future husband um we smiled across the room a few times and we secretly met behind the meeting i was 17 he was just 18 um and we had a little talk before i went home and he handed me a 10 pound note that said love you forever on it <laughs> <laughs> we would spoken twice <laughs> that's how it was wow. though <laughs> yeah I just so want to clear then, to the. I just want to make huh? the viewers, the listeners, know what a three day meeting is. So it's yeah. a yeah. Maybe just give them a little brief explanation of what a what a three day meeting is. Okay, so a three day meeting. I suppose it's a bit like a convention, I suppose. So it was over three days, and back then in the in the eighties, it was at least two meetings a day, wasn't it? Um, so it started on. The, well, we actually got there on the Thursday evening and then it started on the Friday. So you had, yeah, two meetings on the Friday, two meetings on the Saturday, and then on the Sunday, you had your normal four to five meetings. Um, and it was it was sort of all geared towards having fellowship with each other, really, I suppose. Um, getting to know other people, other brethren from other places, that sort of thing. And, and a lot of people did like that's where a lot of times you found your husband or wife, right? Is, yeah, yeah, exactly. Is, yeah, 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 yeah. I knew there wasn't really anybody for me back home. Um, we're quite interrelated in Ireland, so no, I, th I think I'd struck most of them off my list. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, maybe I would have been better marrying one of them than somebody I didn't know. Uh, so we we had that. Um, so I went home. And then he wasn't allowed to have anything to do with me because he didn't have a house. So this was uh, 1986. Yeah, the end of 1986 that I met him. Uh, so he wrote me a letter and said he couldn't have anything more to do with me until he had a house. <laughs> so it wasn't until March of 87 that he actually managed to buy a house. The boom, like scraping money from here and there and you know he didn't have much of a job he worked for his dad anyway we actually bought his parents house because they were moving so um so from March we saw each other from March till September when we got married we saw each other once a month at Bristol fellowship meetings fellowship meetings are again just a one day thing but coming from Ireland you literally we would get on the ferry at about three o'clock in the morning, on the Wednesday morning, uh, get the coach at the other side and travel eight hours to Bristol and have a meal if we got there on time, if the boat wasn't delayed. Um, and then, yeah, basically straight out, well, he had about an hour to talk after the meeting and then straight back home. So probably if you add that up, yeah, from March till September, we had an hour's conversation Wow. Once a month. Wow. <laughs> and that actually um, wasn't that unusual either. You know, that no, 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 couples that would not. have that little to do with each other would get married. Yeah. Probably yeah. later on, even less, to be honest. Yeah. 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 Um, so, yeah, obviously he was from Coventry. So that meant I had to go and live in Coventry. Um, I don't know if you've heard the expression sent to Coventry, but yeah, it was a bit <laughs> like that. <laughs> um yeah Coventry as regards brethren was well it, it is it, different places have got different sort of set of rules almost haven't they yeah sometimes yeah, yeah. Well, oh, some yeah. are more extreme than some are more extreme than others aren't they yeah. yeah so certainly I mean Ireland was quite free as the Irish people are you know there was a lot of there was a lot of laughter and you know when we entertained each other and that sort of thing so moving to Coventry was quite a shock to the system <laughs> um, but yeah, I wasn't, well, actually, 
uh, probably before I got married. I, it was actually in the July before I got married, I started to have doubts about marrying him. Um, just about something that he did to me in the back of a minibus. Um, which I suppose looking back now was abuse, was yeah. wrong. Um, at the time, I was only thinking of it as wrong in the brethren's eyes, I suppose. Um, anyway, I didn't finish it. Um, you know, my family said, oh, everybody has these doubts. And I didn't tell them why I had the doubts. Um, and I wasn't very, so I was, I was 18 when I got married and I wasn't very long married. So, I, yeah, I realised he wasn't a very nice person. Hmm. Um, and, yeah, the abuse started. I wouldn't say, okay, he did physically abuse me once, but I wouldn't say that was the main abuse. The main abuse was sexual and emotional abuse. Wow. Um coercive control in the extreme. Um, part of that, I sort of blame on, on living in Coventry and, and his life, and also partly the way he was brought up. He was brought up very strict and, you know, never allowed to even see his sister in her nightdress when they were kids. You know, that sort of thing, which gave him a very, in my view, a very warped mm -hmm. Um, view of sex and women and yeah um, so yeah lived in Coventry for 18 years and had my five children there and a miscarriage um, and in 03 I just got to the end of my tether really and yeah I suppose I had a breakdown um, my parents got in their car, came over from Ireland over here, and yeah, just took me and the kids back um, with them. And the, so the summer of those three, I spent in Warren Point with my parents. I don't really remember a lot of it because mum took me to the doctor and basically they just drugged me up. Mm. So I, I slept a lot of that. I don't. I don't remember too much. And your parents were still um, in at that point? Oh, my parents are still in, yeah. Yeah, they, they were the in. one of my family, yeah, yeah. Um, and, yeah, in 04 then, we decided to actually move to Warren Point from Coventry to be nearer to my parents. And I suppose, yeah, there was some... Life did improve a little bit. Um, in the sense that I had family around me and, and it was freer and that sort of thing. But as regards to sexual abuse and the state of our marriage, that just got worse. Wow. Um, I think, I'm not excusing him at all, but I think, I think he struggled moving places. It was like reverse role, you know, and, and he struggled. Um, mm -hmm. He didn't really fit in with the Irish sense of humour or... Yeah, he struggled, um, and I was sort of almost just used like a an antidepressant, really. Um, and then things got. I've never. I, I don't think I've ever sort. Of, I've talked about this in my book, but I've never sort of said it publicly. But in '06, he, what I now know, um, was raped. Yeah, yeah. He raped me. Um, Maybe, of course, there's many other times of rape that I didn't class, but this was a um, an incident where I woke up to his hand over my nose and mouth and him trying to, yeah, he was raping me, yeah. Mm. Um, and I told my, well, I went I went to the dad and mom's and I just went berserk, basically. Um, and, you know, they... What could they do? They sent me back to him, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, it was all this thing about not interfering in marriage and um so yeah, I was sent, yeah, sent back to him. Um from that, yeah, from well actually earlier than that, I had actually started taking contraception 
tell because and I and I was sort of given permission by my parents to do that because they knew the state what of the marriage that? and my mental health as well. Uh, it was sort of alive. Um, although just before I left, they came to me. Dad and Mum came to me and said they'd been wrong in that and that I should shouldn't be on contraception. <laughs> But anyway, um, and then the, I just started to, I, I questioned a lot of things. Um, I think, I, I suppose, if my marriage hadn't been so bad, would I have questioned them? I don't know. But I suppose those questions from a 13-year-old had never really left me. Anything happened and that, you know, that came to the forefront again every time. Um, and then in 2010... Three tails came to warm point. And I just thought, okay, if this man is really God, I'm going to talk to him. I'm going to get my answers. My marriage is going to get sorted. Everything is going to, all my questions will be answered if he is God. Mm -hmm. So warm point meeting room um, is literally only meant for like 250. It's, it's just a flat meeting. It's not even tiered. It's a tiny room. And um, I think we got, we, we put special doors, sliding doors on so that we could open into the foyer. I think we got 500, over 500 in that room. <sighs> we were sitting, we were sitting literally sideways. We had no leg room. We were sitting sort of concertina sort of style, you know, <laughs> crazy. Um, and I asked for a meeting with Bruce Hales, um, but he was, he had too many appointments. So I was given the option to sit at the end of a row so that when he came out, uh, on a certain day it had to be, so it was on the Saturday morning, so that as he walked out, you know, everybody stands up when he stands up, um, and as he walked out, the, the, the thing was that I was to get some sort of conversation, some sort of with him. Um, so... Yeah, come the end of Saturday morning meeting. I mean, I was absolutely quaking, you know, this is the man of God. And, and, and you know, he was Jesus. They actually said that at the time that day because there had to be, it was so squished. They had little tiny school chairs in within the circle for children. The so little kids, I think they were from sort of six up to eight kids boys and girls sitting in this circle and we were told it was like uh, the children sitting at Jesus feet <laughs> and he even got he even got like a little boy to speak and I forget what, what was the word yes the word the little boy asked was what does um what does the word flattery mean <laughs> out of the mouths of babes <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah, I just remember, and there was a roar of laughter at that. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, so yeah, come Saturday after the meeting, I stood up, you know, all nervous, and I, I actually had a gift for him. So, yeah, and uh, that's another story. But I started my own business in Owit, and I, I did like personalised uh, chocolate, and uh, uh, yeah, I designed the wrappers for chocolate bars. And I'd got into like the, the, the tourist gift board, um, yeah, the tourist gift shops and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So I did this beautiful um, chocolate, a big, big bar of chocolate with um, an image of Warren Point because Warren Point is beautiful. It's at the bottom of the mountains of Moor and it's absolutely beautiful. And it was a big picture of Warren Point, a sunset. And, um, you know, <laughs> when I think about it now, I, you know, across the front, um, you know, to our beloved brother or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember even what was on the front. And I had, as I thought, to, to stop him, I handed him this chocolate. That was the way for me to stop him, you know. And um, he just handed it to the person behind without even looking at it. Wow. And, I was like, and then he said, what's your name? And I told him. And then he looked at Natasha, who was like, whatever age she was, 10 and asked her name 
And that was it. And I just thought, eh, he's a man. He's just yeah. an ignorant man. Yeah. And then I heard some other stuff over that weekend um, of how I'd spoken to a certain young woman um, in, in the marquee. Literally, a girl of, she'd been 16 maybe at the time, was in tears at how he spoke to her. Really? Ugh. Told her her top was too low and her skirt was too short and stuff like that. And I but hope she turned thing, around and said, I hope she turned around and said, what are you looking for? Yeah. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I remember her dad being really angry and everybody yeah. getting up against him and he was sort of nearly thrown out for it, you know, but yeah. um, also something else that happened that weekend, which sort of, yeah, just made me go, this is wrong. Um, my, my sister and her husband had moved to a new house. And it's quite difficult to be able to afford houses in Warren Point because it's, it is a very scenic place. And they moved, they, yes, they got permission from the local brethren to move about six miles away from actual Warren Point to a place called Hill Town. So they, moved, they had moved there. They'd been there about a year. They bought this house um, and they'd spent about 50 grand on it to get it sort of brethrenized, if you like. And my brother also, he had only been moved six weeks when Bruce Hales came. And my brother, like, he had no money. He struggled. The brother and all got together in Warren Point and helped him get that house. Every Saturday, we went to that house to make it fit to live in. And he was literally only in there six weeks with this big mortgage. And he's, you know, he's just a couple of years older than me. So he was in his 40s. And, um, Anyway, Bruce Hale came and it was felt that, oh, because we were thinking of having a subdivision in that little village, if you like. And so Bruce Hale came and so it was just like, oh, he'll, you know, he'll pass it all. You know, he'll say, oh, yeah, it's fine. He drove past my sister's house. And it, their house is a bit, it was out in the country. It had about an acre of land or whatever. And next to it was a field of donkeys. <laughs> yeah. Proper Irish donkeys. And in the next meeting, nobody knew that he'd been there, except Graham and Nicola, my sister and that did. In the next meeting, the whole meeting basically was about these donkeys. And he said, you lot are no better than those donkeys. In fact, yes, oh. I think those donkeys have got more between those ears of theirs than you lot have. <gasps> Wow. <sighs> what year so would have this everybody been? Thought this was, so everybody thought this was funny at the time because they didn't know what he was talking about. Yeah. You know, he was, oh, he's just joking. He's just joking, you know. And I looked at my sister across. She was just sitting right across the room from me. And she was absolutely in, in an absolute state crying. So straight after the meeting, I went to her and I said, what on earth? What's the matter with you? She said, oh, haven't you heard? And I said, no, what? Mr. Hale says that we have to we have to move away from here. We can't live here. Oh. We can't live in we can't live six miles away from one point. We have to move back in. And he made all these promises. <laughs> he talked to my uh, and, and I remember Nicola saying to me, I'm ready to run away. And um my brother actually was very angry because he had taken on a mortgage and he said, I'm not, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. He just kept saying, I'm not doing it. Um, he did eventually have to, but not, not till after I left. So a good five, six years later. But Bruce Hales then sort of promised my brother-in-law, oh, I'll pay the difference, all this stuff, and pointed out a road that they should live in. And Well, he never paid the difference. No, of course, because you can't. Yeah. You know, what year would have this been? Do you remember? 2010, August 2010. Wow. Yet there's no so, hierarchy in there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so this was all in my head, you know, and, and, and the marriage was a mess. And, and then I could see my kids, you know, 
my older boys, you know, they were thinking of getting married. And, and I was like, is this going to be my life? Is this literally going to be my life? Um, yeah. And then the charity commission thing came up. And we were allowed to watch the BBC news and we saw, um, remember her name now, Baroness, whatever her name is, who had a link to the brethren. She stood up and it was her testimony. And we were sitting around this with my sister actually and her family and that, around this little screen. And um, she goes, oh, they're such liars. And I said, but she's not lying. That is what happened. You know, and I, and I started going, but that is what happened, you know. And I, also, probably from 2010, I'd also, I'd stopped reading my Bible. I'd stopped praying. I'd just given up. Mm -hmm. I let him do what he wanted to do with me because I couldn't be bothered fighting him. But, yeah. Um, 2012, May 2012, again, came to a bit of a head for me. Um, I say I let him do whatever he wanted to me, but this time I don't know exactly what happened. Um, I just remember coming out of the ensuite and I'm saying something or something. And then when we got in bed, he tried to do something and I can't remember the details, but I lost my speech. Um, and, and I just remember, I just remember lying, staring at the ceiling, not knowing what to do, what to say. I, I couldn't say anything. It was all in my head. There was just so much in my head that I, it just felt like it was going to explode. And, um, he actually called my parents then and he thought that I was having, having a stroke or something. Well, they all did actually. I couldn't, I couldn't say anything. I, I I was just like in this trance and the ambulance came and took me to hospital. And um, it wasn't until I eventually managed to get the message that I wanted pen and paper. And um, I wish I could read that piece of paper now as to what I actually wrote. Mm. Um, but I just wrote, I never wrote about the brethren because that was always such a secret, wasn't it? Yeah. And, and I just wrote, I wrote about my marriage, I wrote about money worries and yeah. And the hospital then sent me for self-esteem, to go on a self-esteem course. Um, and I did go on that. And, and I think that is, again, what opened my eyes to this is wrong. Um, so that was in 2012. Yeah. Come January 2013, I just, I suppose, yeah, I, I find myself contemplating life or death. Yeah. yeah. Wow. I had to make that choice. Um, and I, yeah. I was stood at the end of the pier in Warren Point, and that's where I made that choice. Wow. Um, but I had no idea, absolutely no idea how I was going to get out. I thought somebody would have to kidnap me or... And at that point, uh, it sounds awful now, but at that point, I was so desperate and so crazy. I was... I had written, like, almost like suicide letters to my children. Wow. But there were letters to say I was leaving, but I had no idea at that point when I wrote them what, what I was doing. Yeah. Um, and then I just came to it that I couldn't leave. Hmm. I couldn't leave them. I could leave, but not leave them. Yeah. I didn't know how it was going to work out. And I, and I just decided, okay, I just have to tell them. And it was the end of a, a Sunday in um, the 27th of January 2013 and oh, it was a terrible day because I knew what I was going to do I decided it was going to be that day and again I started bargaining with God I, I was like okay we'll go to the supper and if I come out of there alive and if everybody comes out alive I'll know it's okay I can keep going to the next step you know and I, I was sure that somebody was going to drop dead mm -hmm. and I knew all that was going on in my head and Anyway, got through the supper. Then we went to Dublin. Um, 
and I didn't really talk to anybody. I was scared to talk to anybody in case it, it came out. I was scared to talk to my mum. And so I didn't talk to anybody. And then after we'd been out for dinner and we came home, yeah, I I just said that's it, I'm not going I'm not going to the last meeting. And he was like, Oh, you know, I told I sort of told warned him. I told him the marriage was over, but I hadn't told him that I was leaving the brethren and I think I think that was the biggest shock for all of them. Because I mm. sort of lived this lie for so long and pretended and tried so hard. Um and yeah. It it was heartbreaking to tell them. I bet, yeah. How old were your kids at that point? You talk again? Sorry, my earphones were playing up. Um, so uh, my eldest was 24, mm. 22, 20, uh, 13, and 11. And were any so you married? Had some pretty young ones. Yeah. yeah. No, at this point they weren't married. So no, so there were seven of us living at home. Yeah. Um, so I told my eldest first. Um, he was he was uh, actually sort of engaged to a girl at that point. Um, and my second son also was sort of engaged, although they hadn't had approval from Bruce at that point. Um, so yeah, I, I, I told him, I said, look, this, this marriage is over, but not only that, I'm, I'm finished with the brother and I've, ha I've had enough. I mean, I felt like I was going crazy and maybe I was a bit crazy, but I think <laughs> you almost have to get crazy. Yeah. You know, yeah, you almost have to get to that crazy point. Yeah. You have to so get desperate. to, an, you have to get to a breaking point be before you can make that decision. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, oh, I just remember Clint was heartbroken. He just pleaded with me. He said, I understand the marriage, but please, not the brother. Um, and yeah, Scott was, strangely, Scott, my second, who I was, we were like friends almost more than mm -hmm, mm -hmm. mom and son. Um, and he had actually tried to leave himself three times. Um, but he was the one that was the most angry. Hmm. Yeah, he was so, so angry. Yeah, so after that announcement on the Sunday evening, um, it was agreed that I would talk to the priest on the Monday. The priest happened to be my brother and my uncle because we're all basically related. Um, but anyway, I just spoke to my brother and he, and he honestly was, couldn't have been more understanding and empathetic. Wow. And he just took me for a walk and we talked and, and it made me think, has he got doubts too, you know? What what you know, he never he never preached to me or he just let me talk. Um and obviously he was pretty shocked by all that had happened, you know, all that Martin had done and um and then three days later, the priest my uncle and him came and they and they said oh would it help if martin that's my ex moved out of the house i think they thought that if they moved him out then i would you know pine for him back or something i don't know yeah anyway that was the best thing that could have happened so he moved out and i was left with my five kids who were obviously still going to the meetings and everything yeah but you know here was me i mean on the monday i went out and bought myself jeans i went and got my hair cut i went and you know I was just, I just went crazy into the world. Yeah. I just, from that point. Um, and yeah, so he moved out. He went and lived with my uncle for a bit. Um, and slowly each of my children left me then. Wow. Except, except I got custody of my youngest two until they were 16. Um, rightly or wrongly, I don't know, but I made the decision not to stop them from going to the Brethren School or to stop them going to the meetings. I sort of felt that 
um, they might turn against me more if I did that. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I wasn't even, I wasn't shot up until the July, or confined as they called it. But um, yeah, they confined me in the July because I made the decision to go on holiday to Morocco, which was a <laughs> godless country. <laughs> I got the emails. I got the emails off my off my um, sister saying the Lord won't go with you there. I was like, <laughs> okay. So he what? He says goodbye to me at the bottom of the step. So he's going Morocco, but I ain't coming. <laughs> oh, no, you know what I mean. I said, no, I don't know what you mean. <laughs> wow. Anyway, um, yeah. So when I tried, when I went to get custody of Natasha and Oscar, the brethren actually drew up a parental agreement to try and get me to sign, which I refused. So I went through the courts and uh, and got custody of them. But like I say, they went to the meetings every night. Um, so I was, yeah, I was shut up from then. And then, yeah, a bit of a bombshell hit me in April 2014, just over a year after I left. I got breast cancer. Mm. Mm. So you can only imagine. What they're thinking inside. What said. Yeah. 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 Well, and you're so programmed, you take that with you. Sorry? You're so, and you're yeah, so yeah, yeah. 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 I, I sort of, I remember saying to a friend of mine about two weeks before saying, you know, if I ever get cancer, you know what they're going to say. But yeah. I've got to that point where I knew that wasn't how things work. Yeah. Good for you. But I still had the fear of being judged. Yeah. I hated that. I, I, I feared that. I feared their reaction and how much they were probably going to pressurize me more almost than the cancer yeah I, I was just like and yeah it was it, it did play out exactly that way you know that they, they then all oh, they were all over me and you know yeah. oh i could go into my dad mom's house at any time and you know mom would never come to my house but i could go to theirs and you know people would come around with meals and you know they were there all the time and yeah wow but, um, so they took it yeah. as a chance to try and bribe you to come back. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And because uh, I was vulnerable, yeah. Yeah. Wow. So I said to uh, I, dad, my dad said to me, I I'm not saying God's punishing you. <laughs> but, yeah. but, but yeah. what? <laughs> <laughs> but read my lips. <laughs> yeah. For a, a group that, that doesn't judge, they sure judge yeah <laughs> ah. you know you can just hear them all in the meeting going oh this is what happened to her. you know this story yeah but hey i lived yeah i didn't <laughs> die from it but even then even then they had an answer the only reason i lived was because they were praying for me oh my of course of course <laughs> Oh, and the other reason was because I was still on the uh, the brother's um, health insurance policy. Um, so, uh, you know, if I hadn't had that, I probably wouldn't have lived either because I've got private, private health. Wow. <laughs> wow. So, yeah. Um, so are all your children in the PBCC now? Yeah. Wow. So what happened to your ex then? Did he stay in Ireland? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so he confessed everything actually. Wow. He admitted to he admitted to everything that he'd done, but he wasn't he yeah, he wasn't shut up or anything. He was he's mm -hmm. fine, yeah. I mean he's not fine. He's he's apparently he's an alcoholic from what I understand, but yeah. Um oh, they all but are. yes, he has he has his children there. Um, yeah, so Natasha turned 16 in January 2016, and in on, on St. Patrick's Day of March, 
16. So they asked if they could go out with the brother and family for the day. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah you know, I don't want to spoil their fun. And um, I said, as long as you're back for nine o'clock, because it was school the next day. And um, they didn't come home. Oh, wow. And they weren't answering their phones. And eventually I got an email to my ex and, and he rang me and he said, they're not coming home. And I said, hang on a minute. Oscar's only 15, you know. Yeah. And, I, you know, I said, get them here straight away. And, and he said, no, Natasha's 16. She doesn't, she doesn't need to come. It's her choice. Um, and I said, well, you've got to get Oscar here now. And they did bring up, he did bring Oscar back. But yeah, Natasha, my daughter, never really saw her again properly after that. She came to pick up her clothes three days later and we cried and hugged each other. And because she'd got really close to me at one point, she had stopped going to meetings and stuff. Then they got in her head. Yeah. Um, yeah. And she said to me, I'll never stop contact with you, Mum. But it was only six weeks was all it took. Yeah. Wow. So my youngest then, he lived with me for a little bit then, and then he was heartbroken because we'd become this little family unit. And now he didn't have Natasha, and I had had to get a full-time job. And he was spending a lot of time at Brother and Sizes after school and that sort of thing. So my brother-in-law said, look, could he come and live with us and you can have access to him? So I agreed to that. And I did, in fairness, I did have full access to him. Um, but he would never come back in the house. He, he, mm. We would go down and have ice cream or have a takeaway or something like that. But yeah. Wow. Um, and then, um, yeah, at the end of 2016, he phoned me with his GCSE results. And um, I took a card and some money to him. And then he just never answered his phone after that. <laughs> and he never has. Um, well, they all changed their phone numbers. But like I say, I have managed to get Oscar's phone number very recently. And I've sent him some messages that he reads. But yeah. Wow. This is the part, this is the part of the whole empire that needs to be taken away. The way they split up families. Like this is heart-wrenching, heart-wrenching, Anne. Like it's just, yeah. it's not right. It's just not right. It's just. No, it's just. It's so inhumane. It's so inhumane it's like, to uh, take yeah. a mother away from her children. Yeah. No 16-year-old child should have to make that choice. No. No. Um, and, you know, we've all been there. I mean, we know we know how they sit with them. We know how they get in their head. I mean, I had my cousins living with, with, with us when things were separated. Like, I, I know what they say. You know how they sit there and get inside your head. Yeah. That is just she a... She wrote me a letter. She wrote me a letter in 2017. And it's just full of contradictions. Yeah, she, you know, she she wants she needs her mother. She wants her mom. Yeah. Mom, you know me best. Mom, I love you. But you know all this other stuff. Yeah. Well, and it tears it tears up a family for the for the rest of time. Because I know my mom is thirty years later from when my sister jumped out the upstairs bedroom window and left, ran away from her. And thirty years later, she still has those moments where she just sits down and cries. Yeah. Because nothing fixes it. Thirty years later, it's still just as raw. No, you know, not children, no. you know. Yeah. But my grandchildren, why? Why yeah. should you know? I'll tell you about actually. So in in um. So I ended up actually living in in UK because, <laughs> um, in 2018 things got really bad. Just because it was a small town and um, I, you know, my children were starting to have children and I was seeing them and I remember Natasha running away from me in a shop when she saw me and that sort of thing. And um, anyway, I put something on Facebook and 
the ex-brethren community in New Zealand came forward and said, get in a plane and get to New Zealand. So in 2018, 2019, I spent in New Zealand. And while I was there, I met Dan, my partner, who's from here, who's from Cheshire in UK. <laughs> it's a small world. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. And so that's how I have ended up. But it's easier to be geographically further away from them. Yeah. Um, because I'm not seeing them. It's not so hard. <laughs> Yeah. It is hard, but um, yeah. So, oh yeah, so I was going to tell you a story about in, in 21, I sold my house back home, so we had to go over there um, to just finalise everything. And I hummed and had about going to any of my children's front doors. Anyway, I decided I would go to my eldest, Clint. Because he had sort of would have answered my emails or messages up until I went to New Zealand. Anyway, I, we decided we'd go. So me and Dan walked up the drive and there was this little boy at the window. And that, that's the best my grandson. Wow. And you could see him saying, there's somebody at the door. Yeah. And then he just disappeared. <sighs> And we knocked again, nothing. Wow. It's cruel, absolutely cruel. So I, don't, I, don't, I know they've got another child, but I, I don't know how many grandchildren I've got, I have no idea. Wow. I just don't know how they can reconcile that with Christianity. You know, there's, no. just, there's just no reconciling that. It's just those wasted years as well, you know. Yeah. Yeah. How, how can you how can you ever make that time up? Yeah. Yeah. You don't. And you know, one time my parents tried getting to know like my kids, and it just it's just so hard. It's so hard. It stressed out my daughter so bad because all she wanted was a parent set of grandparents that could be there in her life 100%, yeah. but they couldn't mm -hmm. give that. Right. And they, the kids aren't dumb. Like they, they feel that it's just like coming from both ends, listening to your story and then going through kind of what we tried to do with most, with my family at one point, it's just, this is the part of the system that, that we have to find a way how to stop. I don't know how to do that. I don't know if it's co course of control, um, a law that governs groups. Um, I don't know what it is, but I know that we've got to kind of all put our heads together and find a way to, this is the part, this is the biggest part that has to be stopped. And I'm, you yeah. know, Bruce Hales is going to be like, oh, well, every family gets to make their own choice. It's their choice. Oh, it's their all choice. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. It's such yeah. Crap. No. It is not true. It's rubbish. Yeah, it's yeah. not true. No, it's Whatever not true. Whatever anybody says, oh, it's a, it's a personal decision. No, it's not. Mm -hmm. Read Natasha's letter. I mm -hmm. have to keep myself pure. That's not a daughter talking about her mom. No. Yeah. No. Sorry. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I have been talking to um, my local MP about coercive control. Mm -hmm. Because it's yeah. criminal offence within a domestic setting. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, the, the Family Survival Trust are looking at that they're trying, they're meant to be having a meeting with the Home Secretary. I've actually got a meeting, a Zoom meeting with the Family Survival Trust tomorrow. Um, but, but yeah, my MP is sort of like, well, there's not much we can do in this situation because it's a freedom of religion. Yeah, see, but that, it's not that, a religion. That's that's the part yeah. that they don't get. It's not a religion. You don't go to not church because nice. it's not church. You go yeah. to this setting where you submit yourself to being yelled at for hours at a time. You know, like the, like the meeting that you went to where he discussed the donkeys. There's nothing biblical about a bunch of donkeys. Nice. He was he was using a church setting to berate people, to run them down, and to mock them. And that's not what yeah. church is. No. There's nothing no. about that that is church. No, and that's again why they shouldn't be getting charity status. No, they should yeah. not have charity status. Not at all. No. 
Yeah. No. And I mean, you know, now you think it's funny. We're, I mean, it's not funny, but it's funny. We're all creating our own charities to <laughs> recover from their charity, yeah. right? Like it's <laughs> just, this is just ridiculous, yeah. right? It's, yeah. and the thing is, is going back to what you were saying about like the amount of lies, just the lies that they tell, you know, like that ex ex yeah. uh, explanation you were saying about when she was watching somebody give testimony and she was saying their lies, li she was lying. That is their biggest comeback on everything. Everything is like, even when I talked to my oldest sister this spring, is she really reiterated that, Cheryl, you, every, like you 99.9% .9 of the stuff you're going to hear is lies. But they don't realize yeah. That how many lies they live and how many lies they tell, they lie so much that they now believe their own lies to be true. That, that, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. I mean, he said, tell your mind what to think. And it, it you know, you're not thinking you, the lies are just, you're just telling them that it's true. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Let's go to, I just want to jump to something that we talked about earlier uh, when we're talking about lies. Um, yeah. In, 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 in regards to, um, people taking their own lives, like that has to be the biggest lie that you can tell someone. Can you, can you tell us that story that you were telling us earlier? Yeah, well, I can tell you about the, the, the two, but, um, the more recent one in Dublin, which was two years ago, and although it was known amongst the local brethren, that it was suicide, they were told by Bruce Hale not to talk about how she died, but just to say the Lord had taken her. But yeah. then there was also a case back in, uh, I would say it was 2003 um, in Ireland again, where a woman committed suicide. Um, and we were told that there shouldn't be any stigma attached to her death because the Lord took her. But he also said, Bruce Hale said that, but he, Bruce Hale also said she would have had regrets at the last minute. So, yeah, I don't know how that ties up. Is, do you see what I mean? Like, the biggest lie that you can, you can tell is, like, literally a lie about how someone passed away. Like, that's just, yeah. that's just so immorally wrong. But why do they, why does he feel the need to lie about that? Right. Yeah. What does he have to cover because up? Because he's scared. Because he's scared. Because it reflects the horror and the sadness that everybody goes through living inside his system. Um, if, if, if it wasn't like that, why would you cover it up? And first of all, to say someone, the Lord took him and then to go back and say it, it would have been their biggest regret at the end. He's not God. He does not have access to know how they would have felt at the end. And that's not right for him to, to pass judgment like that. That's horrifying that a leader of a supposed church could make a statement like that. Who does he think he is? Yeah, he did, yeah, exactly. That's between that person and their God. That's not, he doesn't enter into that equation at all. Yeah. Yeah. And how, yeah, I mean, I suppose that's my biggest fear or weight that I carry a, a bit with me is, is that, is that the way he looks on suicide? It almost makes it okay. Mm hmm mm hmm yeah. Um, and, and, you know, God forbid that I ever hear of one of my siblings or my children, but that's my biggest fear. Yeah, that they find themselves in the position I was in, but they think that choosing death is okay. And he's really opened okay. up that belief in there. Like he's really starting to teach that that it is better to take your life oh, and go to heaven yeah. than leave and go to hell. Like who teaches that to a congregation, right? Like that's just but even yeah. Even my dad said when when the other the other guy that died in 2015 um and I, I sent an email to my dad about it and he said well at least he never left the brethren 
see, it's just, that's just wrong. That's just wrong. There has to be a way the government when like, I don't know how a government would hear these kinds of stories and sit back after the history that we've had on the planet, right? With the history that we know of that's happened in these situations yeah. and sit back and be like, oh, we're not going to touch this group. I just... It's just, I think people have got to get rid of their fear that we have out here. Their, their bark is way worse than their bite. Seriously. Yeah. It's just, we have to start having these conversations and realizing the more we have these conversations that it dissipates this fear of like, oh my goodness, what is, what are they going to do to us? They're not going to do anything to us. If there's like, there's such power in yeah. numbers. Such people power ask numbers. me, you know, yeah. People ask me, oh, am I, am I not scared? You know, writing the book. No, I'm not scared of them. No, me either. Them. Me either. No, not at all. I'm not scared of them. No. There's nothing scary about calling outright blasphemy outright blasphemy. Yeah. I mean, it yeah. is what it is to say the things that he's saying are outright blasphemy. Mm -hmm. There's no other word for it. No. Because the man is not God. He he cannot pronounce whether someone has regrets at the last minute. That is just shocking. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 I like I do I really appreciate you coming on Anne, and telling your heart wrenching story. Um it's stories like yours that need to be told. Um yeah. is as hard as it is, it's super important for people to sit down like we're doing face to face and have people watch you and witness you telling your story yeah. of having to let all five of your children go. It's I really believe the more that we continue doing this, it yeah. will fall. It's going to tumble in there, but it still, it takes work. It takes all of us coming together. It really takes us all coming together. There's such power in numbers. When you go up. Absolutely. Against, yeah. Right. I I've been trying to tell this with the, the teachers at the school right now and they're buying their, the, the being bound to NDAs. And um, oh, I yeah. just don't believe that. I don't, I just don't believe that those have power when you all move together. You don't, it's just pieces of paper. When there's such immorally wrong things that are happening, when you gather hundreds and hundreds of people together and move forward against it, they, it you, the NDAs hold nothing. These things hold no yeah. merit up against hundreds of people coming at with asking, and we're all doing it out of compassion. Every single one of us is doing it from our own trauma, from our own wounds. And yeah, when, you come from that, when you come from that place, we want, we want that justice. We want balance. We need balance in this equation. And I think it's super significant, the number of women that are coming out and saying, no more, yeah. sit down, no more, shut up. Um, and I yeah. think that probably they're, I think it hurts them worse when it's coming from women because they thought they had us. They thought they had yeah, us exactly. up and sitting down. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it ain't going to yeah, happen yeah. because there is a story and that story is needed. It's needed to get out for years. Yeah. I mean, when I left as a married woman, it was pretty rare. Yeah. And yet there's been quite a few in the last 10 years mm -hmm. yeah. in this country alone. I don't know about yeah. with you, but yeah. And I think there's and a lot in there have, that... I think there's a lot in there that can look at your story and say, wow, it can be done. And you yeah. can have a happily ever after. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 I remember, yeah, my, my therapist saying that to me about my children. I, I, yeah, I have felt guilt for so long. But she said, you're actually showing them love. Mm -hmm. You didn't take your life. You decided to live. You're showing them love in what you're doing because you're being true to yourself. You're being true to them. You're doing exactly what you said you were going to do. They can trust you and you're a beacon of light to them. Yeah, absolutely. You, you, you've you created a path. You created a path for them to find their way out. They have a landing pad on the other side and all you can yeah, do. Yeah, which I didn't have. No, yeah. exactly. I didn't either. Yeah. Like it's, and I do, I think it's important when, when you, when you're doing what you're doing, we were talking with Peter Hart too. And the same thing, as I said to him, I'm yeah. like, you've got this landing pad at any moment, those children can, can see the blasphemy and the crap that's going on in there. And they know they can just turn around and dad's got them in your case. They can turn around. They know mom's got them. Yeah. 
right? Yeah. And yeah. It's, as hard as it is to hold steadfast in that landing pad and to create your own life inside that heartache, it's, you're such a beautiful person to, you're just so heartwarming and heart centered that what child, oh, wouldn't, thank you. you know, they, they, they've got this beautiful heart centered landing pad to be able to turn at any point that they see that this is all rubbish. Which at one point they will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. I, I, I'll read you a message. You know, you say about. You know, my kids love me. My kids love yeah. me, and and I know they still love me. You know, whatever. But I'll I'll just read this message. That was. So yeah, Heidi Allen that left. Um, she actually had contact with my youngest while she was in the brethren, and um. It just so happened that my youngest was quite keen on her daughter. <laughs> so Heidi was a bit of a go-between, but she didn't, when I, when she left and we connected on Facebook, she had no idea who I was because I've taken back my maiden name as well. Anyway, she sent me a message that Oscar sent to her about me. Uh, th th this is about 18 months ago that he sent this message to her. I think the hardest part for me was I am the baby and she has always been my best friend oh. and I am a softie. So even when she was confined and I was still living with her, she would come and sleep in my bed for comfort. She had cancer during that time. So it was hard. I love her and I know she loves me, but it's just torn as I didn't want to leave her, but I couldn't leave with her being against Mr. Hale. See, yeah. yeah, we just, yeah, we just have to find a way to um, keep opening up these doors. We really there's do. There's nothing in that, you know, there's nothing in that about the Bible. About no, Jesus. it's pure love, yeah. pure love between a mother um, and a child, and you can't break that. Yeah, it's just torn as I didn't want to leave her but I couldn't leave with her being against Mr. Hale yeah so my book is called Torn oh beautiful. I'm so looking forward beautiful. to it coming out yeah. yeah beautiful when are you expecting it to come out well because Rebecca's like been mentoring me and she's been out yeah amazing so she's doing like a final edit on it at the minute mm -hmm. and um I haven't seen that yet, but we're hoping by my 10 year anniversary, which is the 28th of January, um, that we will approach publishers. That's awesome. Wow. That's so awesome. if we go the, if we go the publisher route, it's quite slow. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know the time scale. Yeah. If yeah. I was to self publish, I, you know, I could have it out, but she's very keen to go the publisher route. She mm -hmm. knows publisher she knows agent yeah. she knows yeah yeah I just ordered her book it just came in the mail the other day and yeah. I'm really excited to sit down and read it yeah she's actually in the process of writing a film script for her book wow oh, wow good for her she, I mean I know she won a Costa for that book but she yeah. she's written seven other books oh wow. yeah, I didn't know that oh yeah yeah she's an author she she she's a professor in literature Oh, wow. her. Wow. So, so her mentoring me is not just somebody that's written a book about the brother and mentoring me. She's yeah. the real She's deal. Yeah. She's the real deal, yeah. yeah. Wow. Absolutely. Wow, that's yeah. so incredible. Wow. Yeah, she just, she just released a book um, in the summer, actually, called Dark Hour. Yeah. Huh. So she, she, she writes, like, historical novels. Oh, those are the best. I love historical novels. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Amazing mm. books to read. Yeah. Mm. Um, so, yeah, she knows she knows the, the right people to approach and she knows, yeah, so she'll know. So I'm sort of leaving it in her hands in that sense. Yeah. I've yeah. told her on the edit, just do, you know, just wow. don't hold back, just edit it. <laughs> <laughs> but I think... <laughs> She's just brought, um, yeah, she's it's brought the enough. coercive control side way up front at the yeah. beginning of the book because she thinks that'll be a real hook mm. at this point in time. 
Um, and it's where she talks about when I discover that my daughter has got married. Well, I find out on the day she's getting married that she's getting married. Wow. Um, That's sad. Yeah. If you could, if, if your kids watch this, what, what, what would you want to say? What would you want to say to them? Um, I just want to say that there is a life out here. There mm-hmm. is a life. It's not all that evil that we've been taught. Yeah. Um, I have got a good life. You can have a good life. And don't ever, ever think that you haven't got a choice. Yeah. I was told I didn't have a choice. You do have a choice. You do. Yeah. And choose life. Powerful words, power, power, powerful words. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what do you think yeah. is the downfall of the PBCC? Uh, what, what exactly do you mean by that? Like, what do you think is what makes them as bad as what they are? Oh. Uh, I think it's, I think it is actually evil men have, yeah. Yeah. Power, yeah. money, sex, yeah. all leads to corruption. Yeah. It's corrupt. Yeah. It's corrupt. And I'm, I'm, I'm not saying it was right. I don't know if it was the whole thing was set up in a right thing. I don't know. It was never evangelical, was it? Back even in Darby's time. They never wanted to keep, you know, it was. Anyway. I women have been that. suppressed the whole time like the the, the yeah. suppression of women has always been there yeah yeah, yeah. and that that's wrong yeah yeah i mean imagine asking a museum to cover up stuff about women's rights yeah let's go there right yeah yeah and yet at, at the end of the day you can understand why they do it because by suppressing women right there they've suppressed half of the people in the flock yeah you know, and in order to get control, in order to remain a power scheme, you have to get control over the whole flock. Women is the number one target because that shoots down yeah. half the flock. I used to ask myself the question, is Bruce Hales also a victim of being brainwashed and conditioned? But no. No, no he knows it's a choice what he's he made. Doing. Yeah, he yep. completely knows what he is doing. He knows and what I think he's that's doing. why he drinks as heavy as he does is because that's how he has to suppress everything that's inside him. He knows. Yeah. yeah. He completely he knows. He had a plan. He, he yeah. had a plan back when he, he was had a in plan. His, he had, he a, had plan. a plan when he was in his late teens. And I guarantee you, he carried it out to a T. Yeah. Like, I, I would think it became more of a cult in JT Jr. In, in the late 50s when the whole separation thing came in. I don't know if JT Jr. actually had a plan, but because he was such an alcoholic, I'm not sure that he had a plan actually, but right. that's when it became more cult-like, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, separation. I mean, I just think of my mum's family in, in that at that time. Yeah. Because you had to ask to break bread, didn't you? Yeah. Um, my mum's one of eight children. Well, two of her brothers were sort of late teens, 18, 19 maybe, at that time. And they had never asked to break bread and they didn't want to break bread. And my grandmother actually just put them out of the house. You know, why can that be right? Yeah. Almost like she came from Maple Creek, right, Cheryl? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I think, like, I, I do think Bruce has had many, many, many years to plot how he's going to do this, right? Mm. He's had so many years to figure out how to do it, what to do it, where to, where to gain the control, where to make the women more submissive and don't realize that they're being more submissive, right? Like, yeah, what he did. And he's always just, had the, he's always had the ability to make money, which he can turn around and buy the extra control that he can't get by manipulation. Yes. Yeah. And you he know. just knows how to schmooze the women in there. Like my mom was just so steadfast on always relying oh. to me of how much 
more freedom they have in there and how much the things that oh yeah sales just yeah. understand the, the younger knowledge. generation yeah. blah 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 but they have like they just have no concept of what he's built on the outside of it right like he's just made the jail 10 times harder to get out of i just think people yeah. need to realize that fear if you can recognize what your fear is and then ask your fear, like face your fears. Like, I mean, I know that's a very cliche statement, but it is so empowering when you take the fear that we all grew up in and place it on a platter in front of you and actually look at it and stare at it long enough to realize that you are always stronger than the fear that was that was in, in, enmeshed in you. You are stronger than the fear of no money. You are stronger than the fear of not having a place to live. You are stronger than the fear of not knowing well, when I leave, the world's going to gobble me up. Like you were stronger than all those. You were made in the image of God. Sit mm -hmm. down and with sit with that for a minute. You were not in the made in the image of Bruce Hales. You were made in the image of God. No. Yeah. Right. So that blessing, that essence sits inside you. You just have to access it. And when you access it, the fear just starts dissipating away and all of a sudden you rise up to the surface with truth. That's what everybody yeah. inside there needs to do is remember that through all of this, what comes out of Bruce Hale's mouth is not truth. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, to listen to him talking the other day, oh. <laughs> I mean... You, you, you just that you know my frustration at how they can't see. Yeah, yeah. It's you know that's the, oh or the hypocrisy, the hypocrisy between he's having all these meetings yet there's articles being made, prints, people, things being put in print that there's no hierarchy, that the brethren don't meddle in with their businesses. Yeah. There's no there's no crossover between the church and their businesses. All of these lies after lies after lies after lies. Yet they're saying we are the ones that are lying when they have it in black and white. <laughs> Literally, the complete and utter hypocrisy of what he is saying and what yeah. is being printed that they say. I yeah. remember, I remember back in probably was about uh, 2010 or something like that. I don't know when it was. Anyway, um, my brother went to some meetings in Barbados or somewhere with him. And I remember when he came home. He said, I mean, he was, Leonard, my brother, was saying this in a good way, but he said, it was difficult to know whether you were in a meeting or in a business meeting. Yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. He even used the foyer for the business seminars. Yeah. And, you know, there's, there's red flags everywhere. Yeah. They're frantically investigating inside. They're of, you know, who leaked Strive 23? Right, like it's just a frantic <laughs> witch hunt happening, and instead, like you shouldn't have to worry about these things, right? Like if you are a mainstream Christian church, you shouldn't yeah, have to yeah, worry yeah, yeah, about yeah, that, exactly. right? You just those Bruce, those shouldn't be things that you worry about, right? <laughs> if you have nothing to hide, I shouldn't be. Why are you still hiding? Right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So anyhow, you can't get my information on my laptop. I took it in yesterday and it's all just protected <laughs> up to the ninth to, to every level possible. So this time you don't get it. <laughs> I learned my lesson once. I don't need to learn it a second time. Yeah. I'm going to do that again. Yeah. But yeah, I, after that happened to you, I went and got a hard drive. I back everything up. But <laughs> yeah, sometimes when me and Rebecca have a, are having a Zoom, something goes a bit funny or... And we're always like, oh, the right side. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's, yeah. I do. I really do think that this is all gonna, it's gonna all come out. It's just, we have to stay consistent, right? Consistency, yeah. being persistent, um, letting our fear of what we think they're gonna do roll away because it's not, it's not real. It's complete illusion. Yeah, but unless you do things like, like Lance has done things where he's sort of gone to people's doors and yeah. told them that it's all lies. So that's invading the privacy of people, isn't it? 
Yeah, I, I definitely wouldn't do that. I would do protesting, yeah. right? I would definitely do protests. And I mean, obviously I've got some in the works. Um, I don't have an issue with protests. I, yeah, I definitely wouldn't go and knock on people's doors. Um, I might Bruce Hales, but I wouldn't to the everyday um, people inside inside there. No, I wouldn't do that. No. Yeah. No. You know, that, that's only asking for trouble. But there is a way to do this. 100% yeah. there and, is. And we can do it. We can do it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we can do it. And we will do it. No oh, yeah, longer will absolutely. we sit down and shut up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Is there anything else that you want to add, Anne, that you didn't cover that you wanted to cover? So. No? No, I don't think so. Okay. I sort of feel like my story is not like, it was with everybody's story is different, isn't it? You can't compare. But, you know? Yeah. No. Don't compare. That's always my biggest thing that I, I get it, get in my emails. Well, my story is not like like yours or my story. And I said, you know what? We we have to get past not comparing our stories and realize that just the separation alone puts us all yes, into the same yes, pool of trauma. Yes. We all go through the same grief. We all go through the same heartache. We go we all go through the exact same puddle of muck. Yeah everybody yeah. does we're all in here together it just inserts insert story and truth here it's all the same yeah yeah it really is all the same yeah. and i from the bottom of my heart just reiterate that over and over and over to people that i if if, if you could leave that part out of the emails that you send me because we're all on the same we're all on the same yeah it, there's no yeah. difference no i mean it, it yeah to person a person on the outside any of our stories is just yeah having to leave everything behind is is bad enough isn't it exactly yeah yeah yeah, yeah. 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 well thank you so much Anne, for coming on yes. and thank you anytime i when your book comes out we'll bring you back on and yeah yep. yep. get inside that that will be really good to do and we're really looking forward to when that comes comes out i'm really looking forward to just you're such a heartwarming yeah. person that when books oh, get written you. by such like you're just so heartful, and it's the books <laughs> like that where you really get the raw truth from people. So I'm yeah. looking forward to that. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you yeah. so much and for my coming book is on. My, it's just my story. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for coming on. No, thank you, and you have Thanks an excellent you. Christmas. And yeah, and you. Well, and you. Yeah, we'll even talk though it's to cold for you. Yeah, it is a yeah. here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, take care, everyone. Much love to you all. All right. To share your story or be a guest on the show, email info.getalife at proton.me.